Hello, everyone. Welcome to Looking to the East. I'm your host for the show, Steve Zerker. I'm a professor and dean at Kansai Gaidai University. This is our inaugural show for 2022. I want to wish you all a very happy new year. And I, I decided to start this year with our roundup show. Uh, this is uh, the third time now I've done this, where I've had several guests from Kansai Gaidai and also uh, from Japan as well, to talk about current events that affect Japan and the United States relationship. So I'm very happy to welcome all four of them back. I have S.Y. Kim, who is a professor of political science, uh, diplomacy in particular at Kansai Gaidai University, and Johnson Portu, who's also a professor at Kansai Gaidai in political science. We have uh, Paul Scott, who is an uh, emeritus professor and also teaching. Uh, he lives in Paris, France. He's joining us as well with a European perspective. And last but not least, we have uh, my good friend, Jiri Maseki, who is a partner at Kitahama Partners, also a Kansai Gaidai graduate uh, from the Asian Studies program. So thank you all for uh, joining uh, in the show, you guys. I really appreciate it. So thank the you, yeah, absolutely. So the, the uh, topic for this show is to take a look at what transpired in the last year, in 2021. Um, so when I was thinking about the various topics, obviously, uh, the ongoing pandemic uh, has affected all aspects of economic activity and political activity. So let's talk about that. Uh, currently, <clears throat> as with most of the rest of the world, we have the Omicron virus in Japan, even though the levels in Japan are, are far lower than they are like they are in the United States. And certainly, Paul, where you are in France, I've been reading that the numbers there are quite high. Uh, but any comments from you on <clears throat> the effect of the pandemic on uh, over the last year, actually two years now, and uh, maybe a sense of where we're going with this uh, going forward? Maybe, Paul, I'll start with you since you've been watching what's going on in France now. Uh, for the last, what, two or three months? Yeah, it's interesting. Over 300,000 uh, cases uh, um, today in France, and uh, for the last week, there have been about 300,000. Uh, the government has, uh, the Macron government, who is up for a re-election in, uh, in April uh, with serious challenges, has taken a, an approach uh, uh, different, I think, uh, uh, than in uh, the United States uh, and in Japan, definitely. Uh, there is a, there is a vaccine mandate, excuse me, mandated uh, uh, what's called the pass sanitaire, which I guess is a um, vaccine passport. And the French like to protest, uh, but there's very high compliance on that. And vac vaccine rates uh, for uh, adults is is over ninety percent. Wow, and, and that's higher uh, than Japan. Yes, well, you know, it's it's everything is how it's reported, and you know, when you start at age fifteen and calculate, um, uh, you know, the numbers of vaccinations, it's basically the most 90% of the adult population. And the French government is really looking at, um, um, at the, uh, not just the economic costs, uh, but the generational costs, students uh, going, uh, uh, you know, have to go to school. Um, it's no good to isolate people. Um, and uh, as we know in Japan, suicide rates are up. Um, absenteeism at school is at, uh, is is extraordinarily high. Uh, there's that. Uh, there's that. Um, um, I don't know how long lasting the damage will be, but uh, there's a social impact uh, which uh, will be, I think, uh, more devastating than. Um, uh, than uh, than Omicron, you know, for the Omicron again, I, I don't want to talk too much. Three hundred thousand um, infections, but the death rate is zero point zero five percent. So, mm. so when governments, and this is including Japan, is going to declare this an endemic instead of a pandemic, that is a public health issue, but an incredibly political issue as well. So um, uh, I went to Rome for Christmas. Oh, you, you traveled. I went to Rome for Christmas. Um, yeah. And uh, I, had to, I had to show a PCR, uh, um, I had to show an antigen test. And I've been vaccinated three times. It was, um, it was, uh, it was lovely. 
Okay. So, so, yeah. So, so um, France is holding this. I'm sorry. Go ahead. France is. No, no, no please finish. Sorry. I, I. No, 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 no. So, so I'm very concerned about maybe one casualty of COVID is uh, the politicization of, of uh, public information. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, that's definitely the case. Go ahead, Johnson. So if I could dovetail on that, a lot of political scientists thought that this last election uh, in last October could have been a critical juncture. Uh, and it would have been a critical juncture if more than 70% of the population had actually, of, of who could have voted actually went out to go and vote. And it seemed like a lot of people were angry about the COVID uh, response. And what the LDP did was was basically incredibly savvy, politically savvy, is that they, they seem to have got the public to believe that we were in a, a post-COVID era, like so the big kind of the danger zone had drawn down. Uh, and as a result, only about 55% of the population went out, uh, went out to vote. So it wasn't a mandate. The same people that voted in the previous election ended up voting, but the people that could have gone out to vote actually didn't. We have the status quo, so it wasn't a critical juncture. Uh, and so a lot of these decisions, a lot of these health decisions, I think were politically, were, were political calculations. Mm. Yeah, I, yeah uh, also interesting. on the other, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Jerry, I'm sorry. <clears throat> no, no problem. Um, on, on the positive side, I think that 2021 was the year of the vaccine, right? I mean, I think that that's the year that uh, not only in Japan, but I think worldwide, people got wide, you know, widespread access to vaccines, which I think is a very good thing. And I think it's also the year uh, that, uh, as uh, was mentioned earlier, we're getting to the point. This is not so much a, a, a pandemic as it as it's going to be sort of an endemic, an endemic uh, type of of disease, which is going to be with us for a very long time and is going to be manageable. And I think 2021 is the year where we found out that despite the spread of the uh, curve, you know, Delta variant, Omicron variant, everything else, that we ha now have medicines, vaccines, therapeutics, other sort of things that are hopefully in the future going to keep this from being nearly as deadly. Uh, as it was in 2020. So I think that's very good news. And here in Japan, uh, despite whatever, you know, um, political machinations, the fact is that Japan has done extremely well, uh, numbers wise, uh, as far as infections and deaths. And so, you know, there is there is some, there's a, a bit of a silver lining, perhaps. Yeah, yeah I agree. So in Japan, but decisions are really slow to be made. But once they're made, then it's really, really efficient. So that's 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 a that's a positive. So there's there's a lot of there's a lot of risk averse. I think also in addition to the political calculations that I noted. So absolutely. One thing noticeable in Japan has been that there is no few politicization of the vaccine issue or lockdown that shows that Japan has remained as a quiet society without very revolting resistance against state actions, mm -hmm. uh, and then. In terms of controlling the pandemic, it has been fairly successful uh, just before and since the Olympic Games. The you know, Olympic was a kind of tantalizing success. There was a kind of big worry about the danger of a super spread event during Olympic Games that didn't take place. And then since the inauguration of Kishida prime ministership, uh, prime minister and the Japanese government has taken fairly dra draconian approach, banning all foreigners non-essential foreigners from entering to Japan. And, but we should wait and see because the arrival of Omicron has been delayed in Japan because of this tight control against foreigners. Uh, but just start, it just has started spreading. Uh, nonetheless, the vaccination, particularly booster vaccine, has been delayed. Japan uh, offers booster vaccine after seven months after the second shot. So there's a great chance that uh, danger of spreading of Omicron. So we should wait and see what would unfold from now on because it just number of the Omicron spread has been increasing from last week. It may be a successful case. I very much hope so, uh, but we should still wait and see. You know, uh, Edelman Trust Barometer, and I've, I've done a little work for Edelman, um, you know, very, very influential. Uh, they came out with a report saying that uh, the United States is in a, is in a, um, is in a, oh, excuse me, is in a cold civil war. Yeah. 
And I was shocked when I read that uh, statement and um, uh, that politicization in the United States uh, seems to be um, uh, becoming uh, uh, sharper. And, uh, you know, that spills over, um, uh, uh, that spills over. And I agree exactly uh, with what um, my colleagues are saying is what's interesting about Japan um, is, um, is the, the dampening of that. I'll use the word dampening. I won't say that it doesn't exist. Uh, yeah, I think I, I can only remember one protest and it was a bunch of odd characters up in Tokyo and they were protesting vaccinations along with uh, 5G, you know, the latest cellular technology. Somehow those two things were wrapped up together. And I, even though it was reported, I don't think it was taken very seriously. It was a minority. Uh, for those viewers of the, the show who are not familiar with Japanese culture, this is a mask wearing culture. It has to do with uh, allergies. So every year, 40 or 50 percent of the population is wearing masks uh, to prevent this, uh, allergies. <clears throat> um, so even today, even though there's no mandate for this, if you get on the trains in Japan, it's 100 percent compliance. It, it, when you're on the streets, it's 98 percent compliance. It's really remarkable how the Japanese public, I guess, through peer pressure, not so much through government leadership, uh, has embraced exactly. the, wearing the masks. And I think that's a part of this, the, the miracle. You know, the, the Olympics, the, the, the rates were 25,000 a day. And then after a month, it just went down to almost nothing. It was like a, almost a miracle. And I really haven't seen a good explanation as to why the Japanese infection rates just went down to below 50 a day. Masks. Uh, it's ma I mean, I'm like, you think it's mass theory? I, you, uh, you, I think you hit it on the head. I think if there's one thing, um, that, that, you know, the message from Japan to the rest of the world is masks work. The vaccination rates in Japan are similar or less than a lot of other developed, you know, uh, countries. And the, the difference here is that everyone wears masks everywhere, vaccinated, boosted, indoors, outdoors. It, it's just, it's a, as you noted, it's a cultural thing, but I also think Japan has, has uh, the people and the culture, they've stepped up, you know, to, to the, to the challenge of this. And I think that it's a, it, again, it is something that everyone else around the world can learn from. Vaccines are not the only thing that are going to get us out of this. We need people to be vigilant. We need people to wear masks, we need people to, you know, uh, do things in order to stop the spread. And that's not just vaccination. So I think, I, I, look, I, I, I don't know that Japan has done everything perfectly, but I, I don't think it's incorrect to say that Japan is one of the best places to have ridden out any pandemic. And, and while I also understand that the, the uh, border measures have been very strict, and they certainly have, um, within the country, they, the, the restrictions are much less uh, than than in, in in other places such as Europe and and uh, other places. So you know, I think on on balance, I, I mean, you know, knock on wood, we'll see what happens from here. But overall, Japan has done quite well. Yes, yeah. masks work. Masks are great, and they're also wonderful for no makeup days, which is often why I use them. <laughs> but uh, in terms of in terms of the That's question. <laughs> If I've asked some of the students why they, they choose to stay home, because Kansai Gaida is under a hybrid policy right now, so the students basically can choose whether to come in person or not. And many of the female students say, well, if I feel like putting makeup on, I'll come to school. But if not, the mask goes on and, you know, I, I just stay at home. What All right. So one thing I also wanted to talk about was uh, you guys have already touched on it with the uh, re-election of the Jiminto, uh, uh, yet again, and basically Japan has been under one party control since uh, the 1950s, other than a few brief periods. Uh, so the election forecast was that they would probably win, but not do as well <clears throat> as they actually ended up doing. And as a result of the election, we have a brand new prime minister. Uh, his name is Kishida, and uh, he's been in power now for uh, a number of months. So any comments, you guys, on, on the election or the leadership of our new prime minister here in Japan, Prime Minister Kishida? Can I mention, just to dovetail off of what Professor Kim was talking about, is looking, looking around outside of Japan, a lot of protests and a lot of anger and some people wondering why are Japanese citizens not angry at, you know, at, at a lot of the gas which were made early on 
Uh, and uh, one of the arguments I've heard that is, it's not my argument, uh, but it's by somebody else that I know, and she's testing it, but it's on this manufactured mukanshin or manufactured uh, indifference. So making Japanese politics basically boring, like trying to manufacture this apathy, and it seems to have worked, right? So if you actually look historically across elections in Japan after the post-war period, voting rates were pretty high, right? In the, in the high 60s, sometimes even 70s, and then from the 90s, it be, actually 93 was the last time, and then it dropped uh, pretty low, then you had higher rates again in, in uh, with the uh, 2009 with the election of the DPJ and following Fukushima, it's dropped back down. So it seems to be working in the favor. The LDP did not really get the hit, uh, the the hit for for COVID, uh, but that might change. We're going to have a new election uh, for the for the upper house, which is the most insignificant house among uh, uh, in Japanese politics, but. Um, uh, we should see what's what's going to happen. Yeah. You know, when I first heard the term the Great Resignation, uh, because of my background, I thought, yeah, of course, that's uh, that's you know Akirame, that's to be resigned, and I thought that's a very much uh, part of a Japanese cultural trait. Uh, uh, you know, shogunai, shigatagunai, you know, you know, there's no, there's no way around it, and a resignation, and. Um, um, yeah, I agree with you completely. That, uh, uh, but it's the weakness of the opposition as well, um, and uh, perhaps uh, you know, two fifty. What the LDP won two hundred fifty nine seats, um, uh, and uh, the the political party that increased its its um, its uh, innovation party winners was Ishinokai. Right innovation wing, party based, yeah. yeah based in osaka so i'm i'm curious whether or not uh, japan like some other countries is also showing a um uh, a center right swing uh, one thing I'd, I'd like to catch up okay oh sorry is that uh there's a external factor that has been awakening uh japanese population and uh establishment alike which is the challenge posed by the assertive China in South China Sea and East China Sea, mm -hmm. uh, where America and Japan and Australia had try, has been trying to, have been trying to tackle it all together, along with it, India, under the name of uh, free and open Indo-Pacific. But this uh, trend has also impacted upon the ge last general election. Yes. Although LDP did not perform superbly, it could retain its uh, power base. And as uh, Scott noted, noteworthy development was the advancement, the progress of the Japan Innovation Party, Osaka Ishin no Kai, the cadre pool. If you combine this uh, Osaka uh, Ishin, I mean, Innovation Party together with the LDP, they can achieve the two third majority required for change of a constitution. So it's really an uh, issue to wait and see. And then Prime Minister Kishida, have sta has stated that he would pursue a project to achieve the revision of a constitution. In addition to that, acquiring a capability, military capability to launch preemptive strike to enemy bases if they are ready to launch attack to Japan. So these are very uh, much noteworthy changing trend that is taking place within Japanese politics in conjunction with the change in the external environment. Can I make two points on that? One, the LDP did win 261 seats. Uh, so they, they had lost the number, uh, but they still retain their absolute majority. And then they have Komeito, right? Or the Clean Government Party, whatever it is in English. Uh, but the margin of victories in these, in principally the winner take all uh, 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 elections uh, was, was, the margin was fairly slim. So it wasn't, you know, a lot of people, you know, punishing the LDP and then going to the, uh, Constitutional Democratic Party or Rike Minshuto, it was they were either not voting or they were voting to the to the safe uh, Osaka LDP chapter called uh, Ichinokai or the the Innovation Party. Yeah, the Innovation Party. Uh, the second thing I want to say about the the China issue, the China issue actually helps the LDP. I think uh, so. Because the, I mean, the LDP's main thing, or actually on, under Abe, it was Abe's 
Abe's baby was constitutional change. And he was an extremely powerful prime minister, probably the most powerful prime ministers maybe in the post-war period. You got Nakasone and all there in there. I don't, I'm not sure about that, but certainly powerful. Uh, and he's a prime minister, mean, meaning he has a lot more power than let's say a US president. Uh, and he had a lot of support within the LDP, yet he still couldn't push through constitutional change. Right. That means that probably the majority of, of the population still doesn't want it, uh, want constitutional change to happen, would be my guess. Uh, the thing that worries me about China is something that we started off earlier uh, in the program was that China has China's GDP growth rate has begun to decline. And that's what makes me worry. So as the as China's economy is growing and growing and growing, the cost of going to war increase, increase, increase. And as it goes down, then maybe the, the Chinese Communist Party is going to have to figure out some way to some other way to legitimize itself. So uh, there's so what you call window of opportunity. Chinese growth would continue, but would be eroded uh, within 10 years. Yeah, so I mean, the Xi and Chinese uh, leading Communist Party might want to achieve some goal such as including the unification with Taiwan, which has raised a lot of uh, alarm bells on the side of Japan and the United States. And then now, as Stephen is keen, we have new uh, ambassador from the United States will arrive to Japan. Right, yes, yeah, that's one of the things I wanted to touch on. But, but before we get to that, uh, one more general question having to do with the relationship between the Japan and the United States. Guys, we've gone 22 minutes into our show and we have not mentioned Trump. You know, well, the last shows, of course, that was topic A. So I want to ask you, uh, now that we have a new president, Biden, looking back across the last year, has the relationship between the United States and Japan changed in any material way under the new leadership in the White House? Or is it pretty much the same in your view? I mean, I, Steve, I would say on that, that I, I think that I don't think it's just Japan. I, I think uh, Japan and a lot of countries have started to question whether or not um, the United States going forward is going to be a, you know, a, a reliable partner right. uh, on defense. And, and I, I think that that, that sort of you know, goes to the previous conversation. I think you're seeing increased defense spending in Japan. I think you're seeing Japan trying itself to create its own, you know, uh, alliances. I think you're seeing Japan uh, trying to create a, you know, uh, credible, de you know, deterrent uh, to China. So I, I think if there's been a big change, I, I think the Japanese government and many other governments around the world are glad that the uh, uh, U.S. government has achieved a bit more normalcy. But I don't know. I mean, I, I think that the, the, what happened with Trump sort of shook people's uh, um, faith in, in how, you know, the U.S. system and, and, and the possible future and how reliable a partner they would be in the case of a serious conflict. Interesting. Do others agree with that? <clears throat> yeah, well, even in Japan, among the establishment on the defense and foreign ministry side, uh, they are always concerned, remain concerned about not just necessarily return of Donald Trump, but some similar kind type of uh, agendas with uh, uh, America first type of approach after Biden. So that is one reason why they are promoting the various other uh, military capability and other uh, hedging approaches to be ready for the change uh, of US leadership from Biden to more Trump type of leaders. Uh, well, that generally, yeah. yeah, the American America seems, you know, absolutely obsessed with internal domestic politics. So it's always, you know, my triangle. It would be, you know, skill, will, and finances um, at the uh, at the international level. And I just don't. Um, I think people are waiting, but I'm not sure uh, how long. Uh, you know, uh, how long it uh, you know waiting for the 2024 election, and then what happens with that. And that we're going to wait till 2029. Um, uh, worst case possibilities. So um, it's a difficult time, uh, I think. Um, mm. uh, uncertainty. No one likes uncertainty. Markets don't like it, and <clears throat> politics certainly doesn't like it. There's too much uncertainty for the U.S. I think, my own opinion. Among the bureaucrats that I've talked to uh, here in Japan, uh, a lot of them honestly told me that they felt the U.S. lost a bit of credibility uh, for a time. 
Uh, and, and for the next four years, they expect a little bit more predictability, but they're still kind of wait and see. Uh, they're not really sure what's going what's gonna to happen, what's going to unfold with, with the U.S. Okay. Guys, we're running out of time, but uh, as SY mentioned, we, we ha do finally have an ambassador after, I think it's been a couple of years since uh, Haggerty. Jerry and I both uh, met him several times through the ACCJ. He's now a senator. Uh, from Tennessee, but we have Rahm Emanuel coming in. Uh, before the show, we, we, we estimate he'll come into power, be in the country in the next week or so. Uh, we've discussed his nomination and the political aspect of that. Uh, he didn't win position unanimously, uh, but he won got enough votes. There were Democrats who voted against him and Republicans who voted for him, including Haggerty, uh, voted for uh, Rahm Emanuel's uh, nomination to the ambassador. So maybe just quickly, any impressions? Are you guys excited that we have an ambassador again from the United States? Very. I, Steve, absolutely. <laughs> well, you know, I, I look, I, I worked in Chicago. I'm an Illinois attorney. And uh, I, look, I, I, I think that he has the opportunity uh, to be a very effective ambassador. I know that there were some commentators uh, who have, you know, expressed concern. Well, he, you know, he didn't have the full support of of, you know, the Senator, you know, Congress, et, et cetera. I, I don't think that's what's important. I, I, I think what's most important in any, you know, diplomat, I've, you know, dealt with numerous, uh, you know, diplomats and ambassadors going back many, many years. The most important thing for the ambassador to Japan from the Japanese perspective is how close is this person to the president? Uh, and Rahm Emanuel is very, very close. And I think that given that um, he, he will have the opportunity to be very effective. We'll see, he'll need to have good people around him. And he's effective with the with the uh, with the people from the former Obama administration, who are powerful in the Biden administration. So he's got great connections. Um, absolutely, Johnson. Any any perspective on this, or that's uh, why we, we just have a last minute or so? Or are are you guys excited? We have a, a new ambassador now. Yeah, I'll just say what Judy said. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, I still believe that uh, ambassadors. Uh, would operate under the uh, instruction from the Washington DC. He cannot become free willing, free Madonna. Although his uh, uh, political asset will be greatly appreciated by Japanese counterpart, but he, his boundary will be a bit constrained than when he was in Chicago. Uh, that would be important point. Uh, he will have to deal with or keep, keep in mind. So you're, you're asking how diplomatic will he be? He has a reputation for being uh, very forthright. Yeah, how to balance between the two. And also yeah. Japanese political leaders would discipline him too, very quietly, mm. while ma not making provocative at all, utilizing unique Japanese way. Uh, then he would realize that it's not like in Washington DC or Chicago politics. Yeah, I think well, Jerry and I should have an opportunity to meet him. <clears throat> the ambassador usually comes down to Kansai and uh, the ACCJ Kansai hosts him in, in one form or fashion. Uh, we're, the ACCJ Kansai is very close to the consulate in Osaka. Um, so I, I guess we can look forward to that, Jerry, in uh, yes, maybe the next six months much. or so when he makes his way down to Kansai. All right, guys, that uh, is a wrap. Thank you so Thank much you. for uh, starting the new yeah. year off on my looking to the East show uh, with this retrospective. I really appreciate it. Uh, enjoyed your comments. Um, I'll be doing a show uh, with uh, on Japan and the immigration issue, employment issue. Japan also like the United States now is beginning to experience doesn't have enough workers for the amount of jobs that exist in this country. So that'll be the topic in a couple of weeks when I do the show again on looking to the east. So once again, thank you all very much, guys, for participating. Happy New Year to all of you viewing this program. And uh, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.